So, hi, it's my pleasure to discuss right heart failure and hemodynamics in tricuspid regurgitation with you today. And I think it's a great time to be discussing this as uh, therapies are emerging to treat tricuspid regurgitation. And this has really put right heart failure back on the map and not only for the scientific community, but also clinically. And in the following videos, we want to help to disseminate insights on physiology relevant to diagnosis and therapy of TR-related right heart failure to a wider audience. So let's kick things off by talking about the hemodynamic assessment. In the upcoming minutes, I want you to recognize the intricate relationship between uh, symptoms and hemodynamics in patients with right heart failure and to understand the role of invasive hemodynamics in the evaluation of these patients. To start out, let's define right heart failure as a structural or functional alteration of the right heart circulatory system leading to suboptimal cardiac output and or elevated filling pressures. And it's important to note that this is not synonymous with um, right ventricular failure as it encompasses also the entire circulatory system, including the venous system here, the right atrial system, and the pulmonary vasculature up to the capillaries. The cardiac alterations in chronic right heart failure vary with etiology, but in principle encompass right atrial dilatation, right ventricular dilatation, um, increased right ventricular filling pressures, increased central venous pressures, which ultimately lead to signs typically associated with right heart failure as uh, jugular venous distension, peripheral edema, hepatic and renal congestion, or abdominal bloating. However, a reduction in right ventricular stroke volume also leads to LV underfilling to decrease cardiac output. And by the means of ventricular interdependence, it may also increase left ventricular filling pressures, leading to hypotension, exercise intolerance, dyspnea, pleural effusion. And I'm happy to emphasize this here once more. All of these can be specific symptoms of right heart failure. Tricuspid regurgitation now plays a pivotal role in this dynamic, either as a cause or a consequence of right heart failure. However, once initiated, these processes perpetuate each other contributing to the progression, a progression of um, tricuspid regurgitation, which in turn fuels the progression of right heart failure. The specific mechanisms leading to the occurrence of tricuspid regurgitation can vary at an individual patient level. However, significant TR is a common final pathway of many cardiovascular disease and as such very prevalent in the general population and especially in patients with left heart failure. And multiple lines of evidence now indicate that TR is independently associated with adverse outcomes in a dose-dependent fashion. And when we now think about how we can treat right heart failure associated with TR, it becomes crucial to diagnose and optimally treat the underlying cardiovascular condition in order to interrupt this vicious cycle that perpetuates right heart failure for which we unfortunately lack a specific therapies to date. And therefore, I think um, early recognition of tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure is crucial. And you should maintain a low threshold of suspicion during clinical examination and prompt um, promptly initiate further diagnostics, such as echocardiography, which can elegantly visualize and quantify TR. But on, in the following slides, I want to also advocate for invasive hemodynamic assessment, which not only allows to establish a diagnosis, and by diagnosis, I don't mean the diagnosis of tricuspid regurg, I mean the diagnosis of the underlying cardiovascular condition, it informs you about the hemodynamic impact of TR, has prognostic implications, and might even help to guide your treatment strategy. Here's an example of how this scenario might unfold. A patient presented with us uh, 
presented to us with shortness of breath and peripheral edema. Upon examination, you see here torrential TR alongside a preserved left ventricular ejection fraction and by atrial dilatation in the setting of also impaired left ventricular diastolic function. Hemodynamically, we see elevated central venous pressures, pulmonary hypertension, but also elevated left atrial pressures and elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressures, meaning that this patient has a post-capillary pulmonary hypertension in the setting of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as etiology for his tricuspid regurgitation. So now let me walk you through the findings you may encounter during right heart catheterization. In the right atrium, you're likely to observe a ventricularized pressure curve with a dominant V wave, a steep Y descent, and fusion of the C and V wave. And it's important to know that the absolute height of the V wave does not inform um, on the severity of tricuspid regurgitation. It's a common misbelief. Additionally, you might come across a paradoxical increase in right atrial pressure with inspiration, the so-called Kussmaul sign, serving as an indirect sign for reduced right ventricular compliance. Advancing your catheter to the RV, you may encounter this tracing, often referred to as the dip plateau pattern or a square root sign. And this is, of course, suggestive of a differential diagnosis of pericardial constriction or restrictive cardiomyopathy. As for the distinction between constriction and restriction, we turn to ventricular interdependence as evidenced by discordance in systolic RV and LV pressure tracings with res respiration, which when present rules out, out restriction. But now to make the distinction between TR and constriction, we have to observe diastolic pressure variations. And only in TR does the right ventricular diastolic pressure sporadically exceed left ventricular diastolic pressure on deep inspiration. Advancing the catheter further, you can characterize a pulmonary arterial hypertension and potentially identify underlying left heart disease or pulmonary disease. Diagnostically, it can be valuable to compare these findings with echocardiographic measures of pulmonary arterial pressures um, invasively. And if there is a discordance, it's likely due to um, the most severe TRs with early pressure equalization between right ventricle and right atrium, um, the highest central venous pressures and the most severe symptoms. And finally, I also want to strongly advocate for the assessment of cardiac output during right heart catheterization because it's essential um, to characterize pulmonary hypertension, for example, but also to overall get an impression about the hemodynamic state of your patient. And contrary to the common belief, cardiac output measures in the setting of tricuspid regurgitation are reliable. This holds true for the FIC principle, but also for thermodilution, where inaccuracies primarily, primarily arise from low output states rather than issues um, related to tricuspid regurgitation itself. So in conclusion, clinical signs of right heart failure are related to altered hemodynamics and include central congestion, but also signs typically related to left heart failure, like exercise intolerance and pleural effusion. Tricuspid regurg can act as both a cause or consequence of right heart failure, warranting a low threshold of suspicion for further investigations. Invasive hemodynamics play a crucial role in pinpointing underlying cardiovascular conditions, understanding the hemodynamic impact, assessing prognostic implications, and potentially guide treatment strategies. And with this, I want to thank you for listening and I hope you will join us for the next video.